Thanks a lot, really uh, very informative uh, sessions. And uh, uh, coming up, we have session six, the last session of this uh, uh, symposium, and also the very best one. We keep the <laughs> very best one at the end, so we can keep you all here. I just write checks. I want to talk to you about how to partner. How to what? How to partner. Oh, okay. Could you do my drawings to get the solution? Oh, yeah. Do you have any special requirements of reporting? I'm sorry. So, so we're going to need to see the, the, the load profile, how much yeah, is yeah. mileage driven because we need to report it. Okay. 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 It's not, I mean, just, you know, how much energy you are in the environment. I don't know. I don't know. It's Good afternoon, everybody. If I could have your attention. Uh, one, congratulations. We made it to session six. So give yourselves a round of applause. You're still here. So you are the most important people that attended because you stayed here to really grasp and get all the knowledge that you can. Uh, and it's been uh, two very exciting days full of um, good and innovative thought think, uh, pro uh, for progress thinking. And um, I want to thank the ARB, Air Resources Board, the California Transit Association, and the Ano Valley Transit Authority for hosting, co-hosting this uh, event and allowing me to be a moderator. Actually, I just realized that I'm, I was actually the bookends. I was on the first session, now I'm the last session, so I promise to keep it engaging and exciting. Uh, we've learned a lot. So we learned at the beginning how to start planning and deploying a zero emission bus fleet. Uh, we learned along the way that is, uh, it's attainable, it's achievable, and we have two titans in the uh, transit industry here uh, on this panel. Uh, and as you, uh, you saw already, AVTA has done what everybody uh, didn't realize could be done with 100% uh, electrification of their fleet. We've learned from infrastructure uh, what they're doing to innovate and further expand mass deployment of, uh, of both technologies, hydrogen and battery electric. Uh, and then we also learned that there's some funding opportunities that are still out there, you know, um, and we definitely need to take advantage of that, and we need to continue to push to keep those opportunities out, uh, available for transit operators to continue to advance, either to start deploying zero emission bus or to continue to expand the fleet. So now we're gonna learn how do we keep this technology safe, reliable, and sustainable for the useful life of the equipment. And the useful life of the, of the equipment is not just the bus, it's also the infrastructure. So there's a lot of, uh, uh, a lot of ways to do that, and that's uh, something else that's still innovating, and I, I'm very happy to see that it's not just the public transit industry that's getting involved. Now we have uh, education uh, providers that are starting to get involved, and we have other consortiums that are working to solve those challenges. So um, I wanna start by just doing a quick poll of whoever's left in the audience, if you're a transit operator, just raise your hand. Oh, we have a good mix, good, a large amount. Now, if you're a transit operator, do you have an in-house training department? Raise your hand. Okay. And if you solely depend on outside sources or contractors for training, raise your hand if you're a transit operator. 
Okay, we have an answer for all of you, so pay attention. Um, so I'm gonna start just by um, introducing our distinguished panelists here, uh, and then each one will get, have an opportunity uh, to give a, a brief presentation, and then we'll uh, have some questions, uh, uh, question and answer sessions, so please have your questions ready. Our hope and our goal is that you walk away with potential solutions or contacts or ideas, or maybe you can speak up and share some ideas that may help us uh, to achieve this task of uh, training our, our workforce so we can continue to um, safely and reliably deploy this, this technology. So we have uh, Mr. Macy Nishadi, the Executive Director and CEO of Animal Valley Transit Authority. Lauren Skyver is the general manager and CEO of Sunline Transit. And we have uh, Robert Meyer, who is a director of economic development, employment, and uh, training panel. And we have Bernie Kotlier, who is a co-chair of the National Electric Vehicle Infrastructure Training Program. And Nina Barriarts, did I say that correct? Uh, Nina Babiarts. Oh, I'm sorry, Nina Babiarts, sorry. <laughs> uh, from the uh, Southern California Regional Transit Training Consortium. Thank you. So I wanna start off by uh, allowing uh, Macy to uh, give us his perspective as uh, he has a unique experience in his career path that has, he's been on the OEM and the uh, manufacturing side and now he's on the uh, transit operator side, which I'm sure he has a, a pretty good, well-rounded view of what does it take to not only build this technology, but now to understand how to deploy it and, and sustain and maintain it. Thank you. Thank you, everybody. Pleasure to be here. Um, again, you're stuck with me for a little bit. But I'll try to make it brief and productive. Um, I have a little bit of a different uh, presentation to talk to you about on training, but I'm going to deviate for just a second and talk to you about manuals, manuals and training from the OEMs. Um, and I may I make this uh, analogy a lot when I when I'm talking to my fellow CEOs. If if you were to go out today and buy a even a Chevy Malibu or a, a Ford Taurus, you'd expect that vehicle to come with an owner's manual. You'd expect the salesman at least walk out with you and say, "Here's what a." how you program your garage keys, and here's how you open your trunk, and here's how you pop your fuel door open. Um, and for a lot of years, we've allowed the manufacturers to charge us for manuals, and charge us for training, and charge us for maintenance and diagnostic training. And I, and I, I just urge this industry to stand up to that and say, no, I'm not gonna pay, pay 850,000 per bus times 10 or 20 or 30 or 100, and then get charged a couple hundred grand for manuals, and get charged for training. And that, that is the least that the OEMs owe us for procuring their very expensive, very capable, very technologically advanced vehicles. So that, there's a part one of my training rant, if you will, is OEMs have an obligation to at least get us launched into how to use our new vehicles and how to diagnose them and all that. Um, and, and we've got a very distinguished panel that will talk to you more about operator, uh, training for operators and technicians and all that. So what I want to kind of focus in on a little bit as far as implementing a zero emission fleet is to reemphasize the importance of training at the staff and at the, at the core level of your organization. Everyone from the, from the person that cleans the buses to the person that drives the buses, works on the buses, to the accountants, the customer service agents, Every single person in your organization needs to be trained, motivated, excited, and enthusiastic about what you're gonna undertake. Because it only takes one person who's against the program to, to badmouth it, to, to drag their heels, to emphasize the negative and, and completely ignore the positive, and, and your program is, is gonna be a lot harder to implement. It might even fail. But if you can get buy-in from every level and every, every fiber of your organization and everyone's pulling in the same direction and no one's resisting and no one's fighting you and no one's against it, then you win and you'll succeed. And, and that's really what happened in ABTA. And again, I'm, I'm new to the agency, so I take no credit for it. I'm just looking back on it and reflecting on how well the board and, uh, and my predecessor, Len Engel and Norm and Judy and Mark and those people worked up and down the organization and got buy-in at every level. So that everyone's pulling in the same direction, everyone realizes the benefits, everyone's excited about the zero emission uh, benefits of, of, of 
bus transportation. Uh, the operators can be taught and trained that you know, they're, they're, you're reducing the amount of hazardous uh, stuff they have to breathe in from the bus in front of them or recirculating through their cabin from the, from the exhaust of their own bus. Uh, the physical demands of driving a bus is, is further enhanced by shift jerk. You know, as the automatic transmission goes through the gears, you, there's a little bit of body motion with every shift. And all that's eliminated by electric buses. So at every level, you can take a person aside and show them the benefits uh, of a zero emission bus, both environmentally, fiscally, uh, and, and health-wise. And, and I, I urge you to, to take that really seriously when you start embarking on a zero emission bus fleet, if that's what you decide to do. And again, it doesn't matter if it's hydrogen or it's fuel cell or battery bus. But start a year in advance and, and get buy-in for your organization at every level from every employee. Get them excited about it, get them enthusiastic about it, and train them on the health benefits and, and the environmental benefits and the fiscal benefits. And when you have that organization bought in like that and pointing together and really proud of what they're doing and what they're accomplishing, you are guaranteed success. Anything short of that, and you're really in for a rocky road. So that's really my... I take on training. I'm going to let the experts tell you about real training. <laughs> Thank you, Macy. Appreciate that. Uh, I just realized that I didn't introduce myself uh, when I started, and that was because I was, it was a test to see if you remember who I am from the first session. But, <laughs> but I'm Salvador Yamas. I'm the Chief Operating Officer at AC Transit. And before I pass it on to Lauren, just uh, you, if you were here for the session one, I talked a lot about our experience and uh, how it impacted us when we were not um, ahead of the curve and really expected our OEMs to uh, step in and train our staff from the beginning. Uh, and uh, Macy brings up a good point. We really need to lean on the uh, bus manufacturers and their sub-component sub providers to help us uh, in, from the get-go. So when, when you're talking, negotiating a contract for a bus, start dis having that discussion. Uh, maybe even make it part of your bidding process so that uh, they're required to provide a bid that, that includes some level of training and training tooling. Uh, and so now I want to pass it on to Lauren, who has had a lot of experience and uh, definitely one of the uh, original pioneering agencies at Sunline Transit has gone even further and beyond now with some new exciting developments on how they're advancing the training so it becomes a staple in the organization. Well, thank you, Sal. Um, most of you know Sunline Transit Agency. We're located in the Coachella Valley. If you're not familiar with Coachella Valley, you know what Coachella Fest is, hopefully. Um, we live through it every year. Um, as you know, Sunline has been a leader in zero emission bus deployments, uh, the develop of uh, the heavy duty uh, fuel cell propulsion system. And so hydrogen fuel cells have been on our property for more than 18 years. Um, most of those vehicles were one and done science projects, but we now with pride have a commercialized vehicle that's being deployed in California and hopefully in a lot of other places, including Ohio. Um, but what we found was that, as you all know, especially those that you, of you that work in the technical field, is that technology moves at a pace that training never does. And a workforce that's work ready to come and work on zero emission vehicles is really not going to work when it's reliant on the type of training that we have in most garages. The one question I wanted to ask the audience that Sal started is, of those of you with a training program, either in-house or contracted, how many focus on zero emission technology? How many have electrical, high voltage training and the other elements of training that are needed for our workforce to safely keep those vehicles on the road? Is there anyone right now that has that in their own shop? AC Transit, they're leaders in the world. Um, but that's what the West Coast Center of Excellence is about. Um, this idea was born in a trailer, a 30-year-old trailer in Sunline with my two colleagues, Rudy LaFleur and Tommy Edwards. When we started realizing that even for our own agency, we didn't have a succession of training. We had mechanics that were training others. We had champions in the organization that were helping us keep this fleet on the road. But we really didn't have a formalized way to start encouraging millennials and others that are coming into the marketplace or coming into employment to learn about the zero emission technologies that we were running on our apartment, uh, on our uh property. Uh, you just should know that we also produce our own hydrogen, so we have experts that are employed by us who are long-term employees who understand everything about a hydrogen molecule, how to produce it, how to move it, and how to make it move a bus. So it makes us a bit unique in how we keep that learning on our facilities, those folks 
age, decide to retire, want to do something else, or win the lottery. And so the West Coast Center of Excellence is something that we first thought about for ourselves, but then saw a need for the entire industry and the entire country on how we are going to have a one-stop learning center for folks to come in and learn about zero emission technology, and not just in the transit space, but in the heavy duty space overall. We're not even agnostic to anything. It could be light duty, lawnmowers, anything that's going to work on a clean fuel, if potentially a fuel cell, we're interested in helping to provide training to do so. Um, the West Coast Center of Excellence is also about some objectives. And so those objectives would be how do we teach transit agencies or others to have effective acquisitions of projects? Many projects fall by the wayside just because of the way that they were put together. They never even got to the road. They weren't put together correctly from either the leadership or the finance aspect of the agency. And so this center is not just gonna be about the operational technical abilities that agencies need to have, but also those internal like procurement mission and focus, CEO leadership, how have you developed, as Macy said, an environmental program within your entire agency so everyone feels a part of that launch? The West Coast Center of Excellence is gonna be a place where we also have those types of training. Um, it's a place a board member could go to to learn real information about how a plat platform operates or a propulsion system might work in their area. Right now, we don't, as transit operators, have very many places to go when we have leadership that have seen some new type of system that they want you to go out and buy. So what would be great or what we feel would be great is to have a place where everyone could come to see what's needed for successful deployment of zero emission vehicles. Um, I'm just gonna change the slide I wanna show you visually. So we received a federal grant to build the West Coast Center of Excellence. It's going to be a physical site with a, a training bay and classroom space. We're planning on making this training in multiple forms. We're planning on making this facility open to others, training that we provide, training that we buy from others who are developing it, training that's portable, meaning it's done electronically, training that's physical, meaning that it's a wrench and turning something in a, the bay. And as you can see by this uh, drawing above, we have a piece of property located adjacent to our facility where we'll be building um, this West Coast Center of Excellence. So it will be a physical form on our property. The benefit of that is, is not only is it a place where folks can come to learn about the types of technology their agency will be running, but they'll also be able to see a working transit agency that is using clean fuels to operate. And so we feel like that's a really good balance of not only learning about deploying a zero emission bus fleet, but also watching one operate. At our facility, we do operate CNG buses. We operate all battery electric and fuel cell. So we have the great mix of, and different providers. We're, we're sort of that non-traditional transit agency that doesn't have to have the same bread box bus on our facility. We, you come to our facility, you're gonna see several different types of buses running. And um, I think that's another thing that transit has to start looking at. You've heard the last two days about how we have to change. In our industry, we've always thought that one bus one provider, one set of parts is the only way that we can go. I think if we're really going to start looking at clean fuels and clean energy, we have to be more open to a variety of fleet types that meet the needs of our service and, and meets, meet, meets the needs of our customers, which is a very different way for us to think about that in transit. Um, I think that I wanna leave you with the, the kind of a schedule of what we're looking at. We've already been working on curriculum for more than a year. Um, my colleagues have been busy working with Rio Hondo College and others to create uh, applications that we'll be able to give to the public. The slide I had previously is here for you to see the next workshop we're doing. We're actually going out into the industry to find out what do you need in training? What are the gaps that you're seeing in your workforce? We can't develop a program without hearing from the folks that are actually running service. And so our second workshop will be on March 6th and 7th. We are inviting um, some OEMs, mostly transit agencies to come in and give us some feedback on the work that we've done so far. We'll be talking about the training topics that we've already created and some of the curriculum we've built around it just to get another sense of what the industry is seeing and if we're meeting the mark on where this uh, space needs to go to. Um, March, uh, excuse me, um, in May of 2019, we should have most of that 
pretty much on board. We're hoping to have some classes in the fall of 2019. They would not be in the facility. The facility should be built uh, in the summer of 20 and ready to operate. So we don't wanna wait till the facility is built to start porting out training and giving training to uh, the workforces that are at your transit agencies. So more to come on that schedule. But I do want you to know that there are opportunities now to ensure your workforce and your employees are all educated on what you're trying to do in your agencies to meet the ICT rule or whatever your focus is for your organizations. And I think that should be a comfort for those of you who are either struggling with a deployment or are struggling with how you're going to get your technicians and the rest of your workforce on board to support the deployment of zero emission vehicles. As Macy said, and I know Sal knows this inside and out, you must have a holistic approach to these deployments for them to be successful. They can be painful without it. Thank you. Well, Thank you, Lauren. That's, uh, that's a lot of information. Sorry, Sal. Yeah, go ahead. Um, so back to the survey of the room, everybody that's interested in doing training for your uh, workforce, just raise your hand if you've got all the money or funding you need to implement a program for zero emission vehicles. There's, oh, there's one guy, thank you. Um, the Employment Training Panel is a funding agency. We're, we're uh, under the Labor and Workforce Development Agency. We've been working with CARB and the uh, California Energy Commission building new models to support workforce training of California full-time employees. Uh, the uh, ARFVTP, the uh, program for the Energy Commission, uh, has empowered us with up to $3 million a year to provide a funding offset for job skills uh, related training costs. So the then natural question is where are we gonna try and deploy it? Uh, the primary focus we have right now is zero emission vehicle technologies. This includes fleet conversion, but also uh, vehicle and component manufacturing as well as infrastructure, uh, implementation, design, advancement, uh, support, repair, and maintenance. So all of these areas are absolutely, I think, important and kind of a general push of the technology as it gets implemented across the state. Uh, our program has some flexibility enabling us to partner with an employer directly to retrain their existing workers however they want. Uh, with a community college, with a workforce development board, or a training consortium. And there are a couple other programs here that uh, would fit into these models. Uh, we are always looking for uh, the, the better mousetrap, how to improve our program at the same time meeting the needs of the employers. The unique feature of ETP is that you can design your training topics, select any combination of provider, schedule it, and implement it, deliver it in the, in the method that you see as a transit fleet or as a manufacturer, the best for your workforce. This gives you a lot of flexibility. In some areas, there's, it's occupationally driven, operators, fuel technicians, charging technicians, mechanics. In other areas, it's a small manufacturer trying to move to ISO-based certification, and they're looking at documentation and manufacturing practices. I'm literally just trying to find the best avenue to make an impact with the funding that we have. So these are, these are big areas. Along with the administration and the former governor's administration's goals, we are looking at advancing uh, non-traditional apprenticeship, traditional apprenticeship, certainly journey level worker. If we can have an impact in underserved communities, and this includes workforce populations like veterans, at-risk youth targeted programs, high school ROP output programs, feeder programs. We need the next generation of auto and diesel mechanics coming out with an interest in green technology, but also a pathway to have those skills. Lastly, the underserved communities. The largest impacts are certainly felt uh, in these communities that uh, are you know, sometimes the second tier. We need to make sure that the future arrives for everyone at the same time. Um, I think that there's a tremendous amount of support uh, within the transit consortiums and certainly the training providers and the manufacturers when everybody agrees that uh, this needs to be moving forward. Um, so, you know, there's resource information. We have partnerships that are open. We're hoping to develop new partnerships uh, where our funds can simply mean you sign up, you contact them, outline the training you want to have delivered, your vendors, your technologies, and it can be proprietary, it can be off the shelf. And it can cover the range from vehicle manufacturing, again, to infrastructure. 
You outline what that is, and then we'll find a way to fund it. I think that's it. Excellent. Thank you very much. <laughs> Bernie, please. Thank you. So uh, I'd like Turn to talk uh, a little bit about... Oh. There we go. I'd like to talk a little bit about a different kind of training. So I have a question to ask you. Uh, there's been a few questions where you had to raise your hand, so let's see how this one works. Um, how many of you have training programs, not for buses or transit vehicles, but for the installation of the charging infrastructure? Anybody have a training program for that at any of the transit agencies? Okay, just what I thought. So the reason I asked that question is I wanna emphasize that there are really two categories of training we're talking here. We've had some great information about training for working on the transit vehicles, but there's another side that's really important here, and that is to make sure that we install the charging infrastructure safely and effectively. And uh, that's what EVITP does, the Electric Vehicle Infrastructure Training Program. So this is a different category of training, but it's nonetheless a very important one. And uh, so I'd like to tell you a little bit about EVITP. Uh, first of all, EVITP is a industry-wide, nonprofit organization that is all volunteer run. It's a national program. We have volunteers all over the country who have helped us uh, with technical information, uh, putting together curriculum, updating the curriculum, keeping records. So it's a completely volunteer, voluntary uh, and nonprofit organization. And EVITP provides the training for electricians who actually do this uh, work to install, maintain, troubleshoot, repair electric infrastructure. So there is a flyer. I'm sure you'll want to know more than we can talk about in this short presentation. There is a flyer on the back table right under the clock inside this room. Uh, there's a bunch of them there if you want to pick one up. Also, uh, you can go to our website, which is evitp.org, and get more information on the program. But I'd like to tell you a little bit now. So uh, first of all, the, um, uh, the question of infrastructure and, and charging infrastructure and why we have to do this type of training, why it's important. Well, clearly it's important because we want it to work, but there's also a very important element uh, revolving around safety. Uh, and for those of you who may not be that familiar with it, uh, as the uh, batteries and the power in the uh, vehicles get it gets greater and greater. We need greater amounts of power to charge those vehicles, and particularly for transit vehicles, we're talking about a lot of power. So that's gonna involve service upgrades. Uh, the utilities have spoken to some degree about that. Electricians and electrical contractors are involved in those service upgrades. But there's a whole infrastructure that then has to be installed to connect those service upgrades from the utility to the charging equipment, the electric vehicle supply equipment that's gonna charge the vehicles. And that is important work, and it takes a lot of training and knowledge to do it right. Uh, there's uh, many sections of the National Electrical Code that have to be followed. followed. Uh, there are a lot of fire safety codes and uh, Im important knowledge in terms of getting that right and doing it safely. So number one, they work correctly, but also so we don't overload the circuits and we don't cause fires uh, and other kinds of electrical hazards. So there's been some question about uh, do we have people to do this and how long will it take to get this up and running? So uh, the Electric Vehicle Infrastructure Training Program was actually founded in 2011 and uh, it got up and running in 2012 with its first curriculum. So we've already trained over 3,000 electricians. Because the majority of EVs are in California, we have over 1,000 EVITP trained and certified electricians in California. I wanna point out those are electricians, not contractors. Contractors are the employers and uh, they contract for the work, but the electrician's the one who actually do the hands-on work. So we have over a thousand electricians who've been through this program. And it's important to understand that this training is for electricians and you have to be an electrician to be eligible to take the training. A state certified general electrician is the requirement. Why? Because this training is only about 20 to 25 hours. And uh, you cannot take a poorly skilled or unskilled person and teach them all about doing this work unless they have a strong foundation of knowledge. So by requiring that uh, the 
uh, participants, the students, be state certified general electricians, that means that they have a strong foundation of knowledge to build on, and they can learn the specifics uh, that are required for EVSE work in a relatively short time. So the curriculum uh, is being updated uh, right now. We're moving into the 4.0 curriculum, the fourth update of EVITP, and I think you'll all be happy to know that it is it goes way beyond passenger vehicles, that there are work vehicles, the type that are, types that are used at ports and distribution centers are involved, and there's a lot of content about transit vehicles, both uh, direct uh, wired charging and inductive charging, uh, so the new curriculum is, I think, very appropriate for the needs, uh, particularly of transit agencies and other commercial entities. So uh, a few other things uh, we uh, could uh, talk about just to wrap up. Um, you'll probably want to know, well, where does this training, uh, where is the training av available? So there's three channels for the training for electricians. One is the community colleges. Not all the colleges uh, offer it, but some do, particularly on a contract ed basis. Uh, the utilities, the three electric IOUs, have offered the training and can offer it uh, when they have sufficient demand. And industry training centers, which are also known as uh, uh, apprenticeship training centers or joint apprenticeship training centers, also offer this training. So it's available in many uh, parts of the state, and it is very low cost. Um, this is not an expensive uh, uh, aspect of our transformation to a, uh, um, a, a different type of transportation system and uh, certainly a decarbonization effort. So the training costs at um, the utilities are very often zero to low cost. The uh, training costs at the community colleges are usually a unit cost, which we know are pretty low. And if they uh, take the training, if they're a uh, union member who takes a training at a joint apprenticeship training center, their membership dues already covers the training. So it's a very low cost training, uh, which I think is a big asset to the state. There are a number of precedents that require EVITP. Uh, the California Public Utilities Commission has required it for uh, major projects uh, being worked on right now by the uh, investor-owned utilities. About 12,000 units that are being installed are all under, installed by EVITP certified electricians. Uh, the um, Port of Long Beach is doing uh, a installation on um, electrification now for uh, gr with a grant from the CEC that requires EVITP. State of Nevada is doing a highway uh, fast charging program, which is also also requires EVITP certif uh, certified electricians. So it's been approved by a number of state agencies and utilities and uh, is a great program that's very low cost. Thank you. Thank you very much. Okay, Nino, can you please share with us a little bit about the uh, Southern California Transit, or Regional Transit Training Consortium? And um, by the way, before I joined AC Transit, I actually worked at LA Metro for 13 years. I'm very familiar with the program, and I know it's done a lot of great things. I remember sending my mechanics to the training when they to come back and they were just uh, super excited. I, that was pivotal for helping uh, LA Metro transition from diesel to CNG, so now I'm excited to see what, how it's gonna help them transition from CNG to zero emission bus. Thank you very much, Sal. Uh, my name is Nina Baviars, and uh, I'm a founding member of the SCRTTC. I actually was an academic member when I first got involved, and uh, I was at the College of the Desert uh, directing an advanced transportation technology and energy program for the state of California, and uh, Sunline Transit was my transit partner. And so, you know, first I want to point out that um, uh, the SCRTTC was founded with a very collaborative spirit. Everybody had the same problems that they were trying to solve and they wanted to come up with a shared uh, solution. I am very passionate about uh, this program because I think it represents an opportunity for win-win-win for everybody. And that is because uh, training is a, just a critical component to everything running smoothly and successfully. It's a linchpin type of topic. And so it's not just success for the transits, but it's success for the manufacturers that are producing these products. It's success for the agencies that are funding them so that they can meet their goals and objectives. And 
And um, you know, it's also a success story for the community colleges and the university uh, members of the consortium because it gives them an opportunity of a career path. And that's kind of what I want to talk about today. Um, the next slide. Whoever's, thank you. Uh, our mission statement is that we are formed, we've been formed to advance the skills of our, thanks, th advance the skills of our transit workforce and preparing them for the future. And um, the future is now. So when we start talking about zero emission um, buses, you know, we're talking about training that was needed uh, yesterday. And so, you know, what we thought was gonna be something we could prepare for tomorrow is pressing on us today. The SCRTTC has just completed two bus electric vehicle programs, course development programs. They're both um, somewhat in a, a, a familiarization and they're the first rung of that ladder of uh, course development into the advanced courses. I'm gonna talk a little bit more about the specifics of those at the end of my presentation. Um, but you know, I wanna give you just a little bit of an overview of the SCRTTC. Um, There we go, thank you. Uh, we are a 501c3, I, I think we're 16 years uh, of development now. We've got, to, now as of um, this week, we actually just went over 50 members of our transits, community colleges, and um, universities, as well as private industry partners. They're at our table as well. And we've got 34 transit agencies, 16 community colleges, and um, we were originally founded um, to develop a learning model that we wanted to take you know, statewide and nationally. And uh, we've taken that statewide now and uh, we certainly have delivered um, to other uh, entities with, uh, you know, within the country. Uh, Colorado was a member for a while. They've got some rural transits that we're talking about at this symposium now in California because we've got something called distance learning programs. So I'm gonna touch on that a little later as well. So we're all about developing and um, delivering uh, training to our workforce. Uh, we've incorporated from the very beginning intelligent transportation system technology because you know that's the way our world is, is headed. And um, so those you know, procedures, that working knowledge needs to be integrated into course development and delivery as well. Uh, we, we have developed uh, 33 courses. You can see the course catalog on the front page of our website in great detail. And uh, four of those are distance learning courses. So, you know, our original, uh, our original funding was through Senator Boxer with an FTA earmark. You don't hear that term anymore. And so we have diversified our funding since uh, those earmarks went away. And, um, you know, one of the very first grants that we were able to secure uh, after the economic crisis, FTA came out with some small pots of money first. And one of those was an innovative workforce development grant. And that innovative workforce development grant is something that we said, well, wait a minute, you know, we need to apply for some funding to take, you know, what we can on some of the basic courses or the front end of our courses and take these online. So we submitted a proposal for um, taking some of our courses online. Donna DiMartino at San Joaquin RTD was our first transit in Northern California that gave us the you know, validation that we need to be able to offer some of this information remotely uh, via computer and leverage that technology to our advantage. And so um, four of our courses have been developed to be delivered online distance learning. It creates access, not just geographically, but for you know, the workers that are working on the night shift or uh, working on the weekend so they can access it as well. We've delivered to date, and that's at the end of our calendar year, 2018, 77,612 hours of training to 5,463. And the reason I repeat those numbers is we've counted every single hour and every student of training since the very beginning. And I can personally attest that there's a person behind each one of those um, numbers. 
I'm gonna just go ahead and uh, if you could please advance the next four slides are just a listing of our members which have grown you know, substantially. Uh, not only our college members, our university members, our transit members, but our private industry partners. And so if you don't see your name on any of these slides, it, it, it should be there. And I welcome you to take a look at our website because you can join in a very cost-effective manner. And especially if you're a private industry partner, I cannot think of a better way to get to your target market. <laughs> so, um, you know, the need is also increasing, which demonstrates why our organization is growing, not just in numbers, but in, the sco in, our, in our scope as well. And, it, you know, the changing, uh, rapidly uh, advancing technologies require that the training uh, be anticipated, be funded, and met, and that process is uh, critical to what it is we're talking about because lack of funding is certainly uh, one component that's always a concern. And uh, sometimes, you know, it's not realized that these courses of need and of funding until it's too late. Um, the colleges have a responsibility, and you know, I was in that role for a while where you need to see what's gonna be coming two, three years down the road. You can't be looking for money you know, when you suddenly say, hey, I need that course, because course development is something that our academic uh, partners bring to the table with their acumen of not only curriculum development, but putting it through a process that the chancellor's office in the state of California will give it that seal of approval. And so there's other layers to that onion. You know, we're dealing with, um, making sure that we have certified instructors. And so I wanna talk a little bit about um, the process of our course development as well. Uh, but first, I wanna to touch on, on, on a term that's often, often interchanged, workforce development and training. And I wanna differentiate between those two terms because you know, workforce development, uh, you, you just can't train a workforce that you haven't developed first, and that requires an investment of money, time. Uh, I think our industry is just uh, a wonderful industry, and it gives people a career path, but you know, you gotta realize too, from their perspective, that they're really investing in us. You know, everything that we're doing is transit specific. And so if we're gonna, you know, if we're gonna expect them to come to us and work through a career path and give us that loyalty that we need for, you know, our success, well, we've gotta invest in them as well. So I wanna talk a little bit first about the components of workforce development, because I think outreach is just critical to, you know, attracting the human resources that we want to invest in and that we, that they want to invest in us. Um, you know, when I was at the College of the Desert, I had a hydrogen and National Science Foundation grant for transit technicians. And, you know, we drilled all the way down to the high school classes, the chemistry classes, uh, capture those people that, you know, were interested, didn't know about this, these opportunities in our industry. And, um, you know, we did that with the community college students and going out to their campuses, talking about getting those that were interested in to see what was behind the curtain with all these new technologies. You know, it was real eye opener for them because when you go out to the classes and you start asking questions like we have here today to the students, guess what? All, all they've ever seen about transit is a bus operator. And so some of the first responses that we get from those students is, I don't want to drive a bus. Well, why? That's the only thing they've ever seen. So, you know, we've got to open our doors if we expect to attract human resources to our industry, because we, we are grow we're growing our own. And, um, you know, apprenticeship programs as well. So those internships, summer internship programs, you know, it helps those people to you know, first of all, get a, a taste of just about everything that's involved in a transit agency and help them make the decision. And you know, soft skills too. 
you know, we've had interns that didn't realize that they actually have to be at work at 5 a.m., you know. And so, you know, all those skills have to be touched on, uh, unique to our industry as well. So apprenticeship programs like, um, you know, we've got a cu couple with our members. Gardena is uh, one of the first, and uh, I believe Sacramento here, uh, Sacramento Transit has also initiated one with the state of California. And, and so, you know, I want to talk a little bit about the incentives in, in attracting these human uh, resources to our industry. We're in competition with, um, you know, a lot of other markets that, you know, actually have budget for going out and doing what I'm talking about. And, you know, marketing to those human resources and make it very attractive. And I think we've got a great industry and we've got all these new technologies that, you know, the, the younger people are very interested in. We've got to reach out and, and uh, reach out to them. With regard to the delivery of the training, and I'm defining that as, you know, workforce development is one thing, but training is another. Uh, first of all, the consortium from the very beginning was able to get our funding by doing a needs assessment. And I think that, you know, I want to impart how critical that is because it's, out, it's going out to each of our transit members to talk to them about what they really need as opposed to what we think they need. And there is a huge difference sometimes. And so, you know what they say about assuming. Um, in assessing those needs, um, we also do another part of the process, and that's, uh, you know, identifying the gaps. We're talking to not only our transits about what they need, but to our college members about what they already have. So we can leverage existing resources rather than spending, you know, wasting money, redundant spending of the same courses over and over again and leverage those resources that our academic partners have and pull those resources. Um, so that help has actually really helped us to develop um, the, the documentation that we need for funding. Because when we do an application now, we go in to talk to one of these agencies about how important it is and we can give them our success story and exactly what we've delivered. So I hope that holds you know, some water. Um, host, host facilities for our transit members, that's very valuable, not just our colleges, but our transit agencies. Some house very unique instructional aids, can't be found anywhere else, whether it's a brake assembly or an HVAC simulator. You know, not everybody has those instructional uh, resources. And um, so I want to just conclude by talking about what we've just done and uh, how we did it, how we got the money and how it was developed. We ju have just concluded the, both the beta and the train the trainer of two bus electric vehicle um, uh, courses. And um, the course development process with the SCRTTC is simple in this regard. Our standard operating procedure is that we always engage a team and uh, that includes somebody from a uh, subject matter expert as an academic partner, as well as representation from a transit member. So that the end product is going to reflect the transit specific needs, but it's going to include the academic, uh, you know, acumen that we need to go through in the course development, the timing of the courses, the delivery, the, you know, all of, all of that perspective. Um, every single course that we have ever developed, we put through that beta process so we can fine tune things and we go straight to a train the trainer program. And the train the trainer component of our standard operating procedure with course development is how we get certified instructors. And, you know, believe me with, you know, I think Lauren and some others have mentioned, you know, with people that are retiring and uh, people that were going to retire and now suddenly doing it. Um, our pool of certified instructors is constantly needing to be replenished um, just simply so that we can continue the important work of course development because of course delivery. Because with regard to course delivery, you know, it's kind of like Groundhog Day. We need to do that over and over and over and over again. You know, rotate it geographically as well as, you know, uh, all the fundamental, cor fundamental courses in order to get to the advanced electrical courses that we're talking about. So the two courses that, um, and 
it ensures that delivery ensures that the the foundational knowledge and understand you know the te transit technicians have an understanding of the concepts you know we're talking highly compressed gases and high voltage uh, electrical systems here so you know primary area of concern is always going to be safety and it's critical to um, you know, we're, we're talking about here to lowering fuel consumption and emissions as well. Everything we're talking about requires computer skills. And so, you know, delivering this training and making sure that everybody has the foundational courses are important to the success as well. So the two courses that we just developed were as a result of California Energy Commission had given uh, Gardena uh, and um, CCW was involved in um, a CEC uh, grant, and it was specific to the CCW ZEPS bus, and we just finished at the end of December the complete course development, the beta process, the train the trainer, and ran instructors through that program. And so th that funding came from California Energy Commission. The second one that we just completed, and these are both fun you know, familiarization courses, uh, was through our chair, Dr. Ob Tom O'Brien with Cal State University Long Beach, was able to get some um, uh, funding for bus electric vehicle, and we did the beta on the Proterra and the BYD bus, as well as the train of trainers. So now we have certified instructors that can go out and, and deliver that specific electric bus training. I know, I'm gonna have to uh, pause and for a second because I wanna allow some time for uh, well, I just wanna and conclude by saying okay, thank you. <laughs> that I'm, I'm glad that um, you know, we had this session today because it's always last. And if you look around the room, we had a full room yesterday. This is a linchpin issue that needs to be reprioritized and um, engaging this, this audience to do it uh, so we can elevate it to a priority that uh, it deserves. Thank you, Sal. Thank you. Round of applause for you. So a lot of information, a lot of opportunity. I'm sure there's gonna be some opportunity to come and uh, get more contact information. And I um, encourage you to take advantage or have somebody on your staff take advantage of these opportunities. Do, do your research. Um, and like I shared earlier, uh, just through desperation, AC Transit had to learn the hard way how to train our staff and did a very good job. But we also um, uh, wanted to uh, uh, make sure that you're, you understand you're not alone. Even if you have your own training department or if you don't have a training department, there's a vast amount of resources available. So now, um, just like in public transit, we have to be flexible and adapt and overcome. I want to also introduce uh, Norm Hickling, who's here now. If you were paying attention, uh, Macy didn't just get younger. He, or, <laughs> 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 but he, got, he, he brought his, one of his specialists here to answer questions. But please, uh, now's the time for you to ask the questions. Uh, do not walk away without asking the question, please. <laughs> Hi, this uh, is um, Tenley from Cal Act, and this is probably going to be more directed towards um, Sal, even though I believe you are moderating Lauren and the second version or iteration of Macy. Um, I know one of the issues that transit agencies grapple with is the turnover of the frontline staff and also maintenance staff, and I'm wondering if as you guys have made this switch, if you've noticed either reluctance or maybe additional turnover as a result, just people kind of digging their heels in the ground, not wanting to learn or change or evolve as your transit agency evolves? Yeah, that's actually a good question. And um, you're, you're, you're gonna get that, especially if you have a large workforce. We have 164 uh, journey level mechanics that are you really do the frontline diagnostic and training, but the way we approach that and, and the way you manage and handle that makes a big difference. So what we did is we partnered with our union. Uh, the, the benefit we have is we do have a state certified apprenticeship program that we've been operating uh, for decades now. And we have a joint labor um, uh, committee that has representative of the, of the union and also management. And what, what we approached them was, this is just an, another modern technology on the vehicle. We already know the vehicle. It's like going from a stick shift transmission to an automatic transmission from hydraulic brakes to air brakes. And we're gonna just let them teach our workforce with the latest advanced technology that the future holds. 
which means job security, right? And I think that's when they get excited. Uh, and then we also uh, strategically want to, every, every person has a purpose, so the, the, we did have some, um, some staff or some mechanics that were reluctant, some were even reluctant to touch a laptop, and they're still there, but they exist and they have a purpose. There were, there were our best inspectors, there are, you know, they can do the, the brake jobs, they can do certain things that we already want them to do, and then the ones that want, are excited about the training, we started with them. And uh, like it was mentioned before, I think Macy mentioned it, when they saw their peers talking this new innovative language and doing the work and doing the diagnostics, and it, then it got really exciting for everybody else. Uh, and we do have some that eventually retired, never went to the training, uh, but, but everybody that's there now understands this is part of our culture. We're gonna do it, we're all doing it. Hi, Norm Hickling from Antelope Valley Transit Authority. Uh, to answer your question, yeah, all throughout the agency, there were folks that were hesitant uh, that they, you know, they went from the diesel uh, engine and now all of a sudden it's this black box and with uh, um, orange wires coming out of it and they were scared. Uh, but as time has gone on and that's where we could have done a better job in the beginning is making sure that we put that emphasis on training. And as Macy said, have the OEM come out and do that train the trainer in a much more aggressive fashion right up front. Uh, I think we could have overcome those hurdles uh, a little better and accelerated our learning process. Uh, I'm glad to hear you know, what Bernie talked about in the sense of, of training those folks and having that trained workforce out there uh, when they install the uh, uh, in-route charging systems. Because when we started, nobody knew what this disc in the ground was going to do and, and was it gonna fry somebody or, or whatever and all the mystery surrounding it. So we had a steep learning curve there and it would have been nice to have that trained workforce. So everything that you're hearing today comes together, take, take it to heart because these are the lessons that we all learn uh, uh, going into all electric and uh, you can really expedite and really uh, ease your transition by, by doing the training. I would just add to my colleagues that you have to take it all the way up to the board. So starting with a board policy or some kind of protection for the agency to explore is number one. If the agency hasn't checked in with the leadership circle, it makes it much more riskier for the agency to start to explore in zero emission technology. Once that's done, then it is an overall focus for the entire agency. So not a top-down decision, we're buying these buses, but something that is organically infused in, through the entire organization. I know that sounds kind of like soft skilly and we don't do that in transit, we roll every morning, but it is probably the number one killer for anything new, not just Zebs. If you wanna change the culture and you try to do it that way, it never works. So we have to take some of those things that haven't necessarily been a part of our business model because we are so operational and start looking more at culture and communication when we're going to launch a Zeb program. I just would like to add as well, um, almost reinforcing the level of investment that you're making in the equipment, any investment that you're making in that workforce ultimately will lead to lower turnover. It's gonna facilitate and be represented in, in responses to training additionally down the road and further implementation or innovation regarding equipment and technologies. We've seen it. Certainly anything that will support the labor management partnership that exists, primarily in the transit fleets, I, I think it just really reinforces the investment. We have a question here in the middle. Um, how much, uh, how many hours is, uh, should we expect to put in for training for just a, re a reasonably educated mechanic to be able to safely work on one of the, the on an electric bus? And then number two, um, since it's such an unusual or a different industry, either electric or hydrogen, um, how do you specify training into specifications for our bus RFPs? I could start with uh, at least some of the experience. So uh, the first thing you wanna do obviously is, is uh, safety and familiarization. Uh, we, we invest eight hours and we're actually doing that right now. Uh, we have our first hydrogen fuel cell bus from New Flyer that we received uh, tomorrow and Friday. We have uh, trainers that are gonna be on property training our mechanics and it's an eight hour class um, and they're just gonna teach them the do's and don'ts, what the orange cable means and how to de-energize and how to be safe around the bus, just basic understanding. Uh, we do that with our operators, we do that with our service employees that fuel and clean and take the revenue out of the vehicles and then we do it with our mechanics. 
So that's about eight hours, and then uh, we also do basic preventive maintenance. That's number one. We have to know what do we have to do to continue to maintain the technology on that bus so that it can run efficiently. We do a 40-hour course. It's a one-week course that we take the mechanics through the basic preventive maintenance, uh, and it runs through the electric drive motor, the fuel cell, the tanks. So it, an electric bus might be a little bit less because you have less equipment on there. And then we do a, a 40 hour of basic diagnostics on the fuel cell itself, the uh, energy storage system, the battery uh, management system, and then the hydrogen tanks and the electric drive motors. And um, once all the mechanics go through that uh, process, then we did the five week uh, hands-on training experience where they actually are assigned to a trainer into a division and they do all the work on those vehicles uh, and right around week three, we bring another set of mechanics in and the mechanics start to train each other. And that's another way that we make sure that it stays within the culture of the mechanics. Because uh, generally, um, adult learners, if you can teach something, you, you mastered it. And when you start teaching it and you teach your friends to, to learn it, uh, it, it just sinks in a li little bit more. I would just add to um, kind of make a decision. Are you going to be reliant on your OEM for every problem in the bus and in the yard, or are you going to start training your workforce to anticipate and fix them? And so it's kind of a new mindset for us, right? So sometimes we start looking at the numbers of how long and how much it's going to cost to do the training. You will pay anyway. You will either pay in time and that bus being down, or you will pay up front and get your workforce properly trained and put the investment in your own folks. I happen to be a believer in training our own workforces to do the work instead of being reliant on others. But that's a philosophy that your agency should determine before you start going down one path or the other. I agree. We have a, we're having an incredibly difficult time not only holding mechanics because of attrition retirement, but we are having a very hard time filling positions. Uh, the, actually, people are retiring faster than we can get them. So uh, it, we, we, we tend towards, you know, filling holes and then you start settling for less qualified people. And that's my biggest concern is that we're getting folks that from UTI that never really even worked on, on cars that much. How, how do we deal with that? Well, and, and the same thing with the operators. Uh, and so we're working with our local community college to try to set up that training program. And we, we have some funding set aside and we're working with them right now because we wanna have exactly those kind of trained individuals so that when we do have that opening, we're fortunate, we have the bus manufacturer just right down the road from us too. And then there's also other manufacturing facilities that can use those same skill sets. So if they don't come to AVTA, they can go to a BYD or they can go to some of the other manufacturing facilities. And then of course we have the Northrop's, the Boeing's and the, the Lockheed's all there, which again, that same skill set, they could go apply for those entry level jobs. So we have that very fortunate uh, coming together of all those uh, needs. And, and so we're gonna go market it that way. It's gonna be for us first and foremost, but we know that if we can't employ that person, they have other opportunities. I have a question for you. Do you have your own training department or do you just? Okay. The reason I ask that is obviously you wanna get your trainer out to the training and you, I, I don't think we answered the second part of your question. How do we get training into a procurement? So generally, um, when you do a bid, you want to you want to put that there's training requirements, and then you can designate where those hours are. Obviously, the OEM is going to let you know how much money, depending on how much money you budget for the training, where you can invest those hours. And what we started to do is our mechanics already know the bus, mm -hmm. so we don't need a lot of training on the doors, on the air brake system, on the air conditioning. We need training on the new technology, and we put a lot of hours into those. And we tried, and then the first ones that get trained are the trainers, along with the uh, lead mechanics and even some supervisors so they can reproduce the training. So that's another way to do that. So, so um, I know this is a separate category and there's a lot of focus on the bus mechanics, but I do think it's important that you all know how you get uh, EVI cert EVITP certified electricians on your infrastructure jobs. Uh, first of all, uh, they, there are, as I said, there are over a thousand that are trained already in California. Uh, there's a list of the contractors on the website. Once again, please uh, pick up a flyer on your way out. It's on the back table. Uh, there's some information there. And the website is evitp.org. And on that website, there are over 50 contractors 
who are already approved and have those EVITP certified electricians on staff and they're ready to go, they're already trained. Uh, so I think that'll make it helpful. Uh, also, when you put out an RFP or an RFQ, if you put in your spec that the contractor has to have EVITP certification to do the work, then those contractors will either have, have them already or they'll have to get them trained to do the work so you can be sure it's gonna be done right and it's gonna be done safely. One last point is, um, I know this, there's not a lot of cost involved in this, and I'm sure you're very disappointed about that, but there's a little bit of cost in, in the training. Uh, it's not your cost, it's the cost of the uh, contractors to get people trained. Uh, and I failed to mention that my good friend Robert has provided money, the uh, Employment train Training Panel, ETP, has provided money to train EBITP, and uh, they're, I think they're willing to continue, right? Yeah, certainly. Yeah, thank you, Robert. Yeah. Um, I would just add, please do not feel you are alone in your circumstance. I would definitely urge you to ask partners, uh, neighboring agencies, uh, any industrially based partnerships, and I'm gonna point kind of over that way towards, um, for help in that conversation. It starts with a conversation. But where you will be in six months and 18 months from now will be dramatically different than if you sit there and try and do this on your own. Not that you're not capable, but just, I would hate for you to feel that way and have that not help you move towards it, you know, moving in the direction that we need to go. I'd also like to, you know, remind everybody that is a member and those who aren't that can be a member of the SCRTTC, we write letters of support for all of our transit members that are pursuing, you know, funding uh, applications. And that includes the new technologies that you're talking about, Mike. You know, we've got, as Lauren indicated, Rio Hondo has got another National Science Foundation grant and some other uh, grants, and so we, you know, we encourage you to, and there's literature downstairs on the table before you leave this building, please take take some information home with you so I don't have to carry it home on a plane, but, uh, <laughs> you know, we, we've got a one-page uh, marketing flyer that you can insert and, you know, and uh, allocate, you know, and early on, too, when the SCRTTC was first being formed, you know, we talked to a lot of the OEMs, and uh, one of the things they told us is, you know, we're in the business of making this, or we're in the business of making that. We're not in the business of doing training. So, you know, keep that in mind, and, you know, write the SCRTTC uh, into your, your funding for these new projects, and uh, I venture to say, if we don't have it, we're working on it. Last thing, you're a technology company that does transit. And when you start marketing yourself that, that way to the workforce, you attract a different type of employee. Yeah. And so looking at yourself differently from just, when you say mechanic even, as opposed to technician, how many people you still use the term mechanic in their shops? Right. That is a word that a millennial is not interested in. When you start saying technology technician, now it's a whole new career. And so that's why I stress that transit has to grow up a little bit and start getting more mainstream on the terms that we use for ourselves because the next workforce is not interested in what we're providing or what we're doing. Okay, we got a, maybe time for two questions. Tommy, go ahead and then we have one more in the back. Uh, well, mine's maybe not a question, but I would like to add a little oh, bit. Sure. I think that it's very important that uh, we, we also had the eight-hour class for our technicians on the new flyer buses recently. It was great training. I think it's very important, uh, and it ties into what some of the folks have just talked about. When you procure the buses, when you look at this technology, don't leave that as the last thing you think of. Include it in your, your, your uh, uh, grant applications and stuff. And think about it, there's, there's lots of ways to get this. And I think the funders have a role that maybe in, with this new technology coming on that they are gonna have to help us make sure that people that are gonna get this funding for this new technology is going to get the training needed to keep the, 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 this technology moving and successful. 
very good we, point. We have another partner in the room too, California Transit Association has spoken up very uh, repeatedly uh, with regard to this issue on behalf of our industry. And so don't forget, you know, Michael Pimentel is sitting right there. <laughs> and so he can be helpful too. Okay, uh, we have maybe a couple more minutes for one last question. Anybody else have a question? I have an announcement for the winner of our prize from our uh, from our drawing we did. It better be me. <laughs> <laughs> no one on the panel will win. <laughs> okay, we have one one last question here of Kellak. I'm I'm sorry. I should probably just ask you to have a conversation after the fact. But the five week training that you were talking about is that something written into your specs where you require the OEM to provide the initial training to your trainers to then. Tra Okay, awesome. No, actually, oh. it's not. Uh, oh. That What that is, is our trainer, um, Jose Vega, and if you visit our bus, he was in the, on that bus, and he's a, he's a brilliant gentleman. He uh, came up with the concept because he was training some of the mechanics, and sometimes they didn't have the, uh, they didn't have the, ex the experience to really hands-on do everything that he trained them to do because not all the facilities have that, that same bus, a hydrogen bus. So um, he brought the curriculum. We bring them back to our shop, and our trainers train the mechanics and on how to do. So for example, if a bus breaks down on the road or there's an issue, he, he, they bring them in. He goes through the wiring diagrams. He teaches them how to do the research, how to find the codes, how to, what are the values. So uh, everything's done. They do the basic maintenance, for sure, but they handle all of any failures. Um, and they do that for five weeks. So it's, it's almost ad hoc. And it's, real, it's live, live demonstration training. It's just, they, they already learned the material. Uh, so that's not something that our, our uh, OEM trainers do. They will teach us the basics and what's in the manuals and what are the, the wire schematics. And we teach the hands-on live experience training. I think what we're talking about, Tenley, is putting the money in in the grant to pay your mechanics for the training. Right. But I think, Sal, I'm not gonna speak for you, but for Sunline, we feel like owning that training and not relying on only outside sources is what's key to us and why we've continued our program so successfully. If we were just calling someone every time something something showed up that we didn't know what to do, our buses wouldn't be on the road like they are today. And so I think you want to set aside the funding to do it through your grant. That doesn't necessarily mean you want to purchase it all. You want to start getting your own folks where they can give it. I would just like to add, and maybe pointing in off the question here, uh, in addition to thinking about the workers that you have now, it is, it is modernizing the structure of your occupation and, and the investment that you're making in them. We'll also look at the feeder programs, where are you recruiting from? Where have you had success? And is there a way that with your input or even expertise or I need these skills, that worker worked out well, how can you improve the programs that you're recruiting from? And if there's a way to incorporate our funding to support that customization or advancement in pre-employment training, we'd certainly be looking at it. If there's a pre-apprenticeship program that serves in particularly a targeted population, a way to advance their uh, employability with either internships or uh, employer or subsidized employment, if there are avenues where our funding can support the training in those environments, we are all ears. And I would really, really like to build a successful program in this area and then bring it back to you guys to present and say, look, this is what we've been doing. Thank you very much. Yeah. So let's give a round of applause to our panelists and then Lauren's gonna All have right, a special so announcement. I'm gonna, I'm gonna pull a card from this uh, and I really wanna stay, thank my staff for getting this all here together. So I am like randomly picking somebody out. Uh-oh, I see AC Transit, oh. who is it? It's Jose Vega. Oh. Yay! You put it in the universe. And the last thing is if you didn't get one of these brochures, we have started Zero Mission Bus Resource Alliance. It is all made up of transit agencies, very low membership fees. If you need one of these, your transit operator, see me, and I have a couple more. Thanks for letting me make that shameless plug, Sal. Oh. <laughs> Thank you, everybody. Where are you located? I know you have your car. But... Well, I'm in San Jose, Okay. but I work all across California. Oh, don't leave yet. Don't you guys want to know the next steps? We're very happy to have our co-host, California Transit Association and the Air Resources Board to talk about uh, uh, what we have heard today, to yesterday, and also what's the next. So let's welcome Michael Pimatel and also Jack Kitowski. 
So we have uh, other people like yourselves that come in and we get them, get you on the agenda, come in and talk about this. So, okay, you know, give me great. a call or. All right. So thank you all for sticking around uh, and for being troopers over these long uh, last two days. Uh, so I'd like to begin my re remarks this afternoon with a big thanks to, of course, the California Air Resources Board and Antelope Valley Transit Authority for co-sponsoring uh, this really wonderful showcase and symposium. And in particular, I'd like to acknowledge uh, and thank uh, Yao Chen Chow with ARB and then Macy Nishadi and Norm Hickling with AVTA uh, for their hard work on getting the nuts and bolts of this uh, symposium just right. In my view, they did all the heavy lifting and I hope that you'll give them a, a round of applause. Now, as I look back on these past two days, uh, I see evidence of a new but still growing partnership between the state and its trans transit industry, uh, focused on supporting the mass deployment of zero emission transit buses. The conversations you heard uh, at this event were refreshing. Uh, they were candid, but even handed, and they help us all to identify the real world barriers to electrification so we can marshal our resources and collectively work past them. It's with that in mind that I hope to reflect back on some of what we heard from the panelists and offer a few thoughts on near-term actions we should take. I've only got three, so this won't take too long. The first is uh, the high cost uh, of ZEBS remains an issue for transit agencies. And as we heard uh, Fred Silver at CalStart say, uh, we shouldn't expect incentives in the hundreds of million, millions of dollars forever. In the near term, we should be advocating together to drive available funding for programs like HFIP, up so we can increase purchase volumes in the early 2020s and bring costs down sooner. The governor's current budget has $132 million for zero emission trucks, buses, and off-road freight. I think together we can hopefully do a bit better than that. And we might also explore focused financing mechanisms so that when funding inevitably dries up, and whether that's in a given year or in the long term, or an agency loses out on a competitive grant, uh, there are other means to afford zero emission buses. The second one is, uh, in many cases, operating uh, zero emission buses is not cheaper than operating conventionally fueled vehicles. After the presentation by NREL, Ray, Ray Pingle with the Sierra Club, um, smartly asked if the cost per mile figures that Leslie offered reflect LTFS credits, which we all know can significantly reduce the cost of zero emission bus operations. That was out of NREL's scope of work, but even if it had been included, it strikes me that many transit agencies, because they're so new to electrification, still struggle with understanding how to take advantage of LCFS. So in the near term, I think we ought to explore hosting another workshop specific to LCFS, and I'm commending this to Jack and his team and whoever now is at the LCFS uh, division, uh, to ensure transit agencies know the fundamentals of the program and establish a fluency with it uh, to make it easy for them to realize operational cost savings. Uh, we must also remain engaged with the CPUC through their ongoing SB 350 proceedings so that we're treating the underlying causes of these higher operation, operational costs rather than just masking them. And then finally, transitioning from zero emission bus pilots or the early uh, deployments to full electrified fleets is going to be a challenge. Uh, there's a cost of the transition, of course, but there's also the looming issues of infrastructure build out, depot space limitations, and as the last panel highlighted, workforce uh, training and development, among others. As you saw, the most well-healed uh, healed agencies will be able to lean on teams of consultants with expertise on these uh, various issues, but we must be wide-eyed that not all agencies are equally advantaged. Some of them may be relying on symposiums like this one uh, to guide their initial thinking while turning to their fellow agencies for additional support. In the near term, we should be working to take the guesswork out of launching a ZEB project by writing the best practices, and this may be an opportunity for ARB in partnership with the Institute for Transportation Studies and coordinating a steady set of educational opportunities for the transit industry. When new training modules are developed with public funding, whether that's from ARB or the CEC, we must guarantee that these are shareable across the industry. And AVTA pointed out uh, that their operator training module is one that uh, was built with this type of flexibility in mind. Now this list of observations and near-term actions is by no means comprehensive, and it probably downplays what I think is a reset working relationship between the California Transit Association and the California Air Resources Board. I wanna thank you all for attending this great event, uh, and thanks again to ARB, uh, to AVTA, and our co-sponsors of last night's event, BAA Systems. I look forward to continuing to develop this working relationship and to achieve the goals of the ICT. Thank you.
and it's really unfair. I should have told Michael this raises. Um, <laughs> that's the home field advantage here. <laughs> so uh, so uh, thank you all. I only have a couple minutes of comments, so we'll get you out of here uh, a little bit early today. Uh, we did have a little bit of everything the last couple of days. Um, interesting panelists with some great information. Uh, State-of-the-art buses outside, relevant exhibitors. Um, we had an amazing success story um, from China, um, a wonderful reception last night. That was really fun, an award ceremony. But we didn't think we were giving you your money's worth, so uh, that's why we scheduled the fire alarm and the emergency evacuation this morning. And I hope that really you know, brought it all home. So you're welcome. Uh, M Michael had uh, some thanks to the people who organized that, and I want to mirror those thanks. Uh, that is a, a hard job, a job that I would not do well. Um, so the folks he mentioned, uh, thank you. And uh, there were many, many others that uh, worked alongside them, and we, we really appreciate that. I, uh, I think this is successful because of those efforts. Um, and uh, thank you also to the co-sponsors um, from, from CARB, from me, to CTA, and to ABTA. Thank you. Um, and especially thank BAE and CTA for the uh, reception last night. That was a lot of fun, and who would have thought we would have needed a, a couple of drinks after that, uh, after a day we're talking about these, these subjects. Um, and then finally, I want to thank the panelists. Um, uh, manufacturers, the exhibitors. Part of this was bringing the transit agencies together, you folks, with the right information that was uh, up here uh, and the right people, both in the panels and the exhibitors. So I hope you were able to make some connections over the last two days. Uh, moving forward, um, I, th I think Michael had some good observations, bus cost incentives. He mentioned infrastructure and workforce training that we just had here. Um, those will all take extended efforts, and I think those are important. We will continue to work on those, and we look forward to working with you on those. Um, the interesting thing Michael mentioned was he had a couple of very tangible um, ideas. Um, the uh, focused LCFS workshop and the training modules. And, training modules. Um, and we can help with those, and I guess to leave you sort of with one, uh, one more thing to think about on your way out. You know, what are the best ways for CARB to invest its resources to help with this transition? Like all of you, we have you know, limited funds, limited staff resources, but we want to invest those strategically in a way that can help you the most. And, and that sort of leaves us to where we started, you know, at the end here. The, the, the words of partnership, which we've, we've said several times that we still strongly believe. Um, we want to work with you. We want to understand the best way. We recognize you are on the front lines here, seeing these issues firsthand. So we want to know what is most useful to you. Uh, I feel like I should be throwing out a Jerry Maguire quote here, you know, help me help you here. And, if anybody's under 30 years old, they probably don't know what I'm talking about. But most of the folks here, I think, do. So that's probably OK. Um, you all know, I think, by now, Yaochen here. Um, yes, she's a great job. Um, so please, as you're thinking about this on your way home tonight, when you wake up in the middle of the night thinking of this brilliant idea of what we should be doing, consult with her. Um, we're, we're happy to consider and brainstorm ideas on how to move forward. And so uh, the last thanks of the day go out to actually to all of you. Thank you for contributing, making this successful. Um, appreciate it and safe travels. Thank you.